So in order to take a picture of space, you need to be able to track the stars in the night sky. This will make sure that you have a clear and crisp image without any motion blur. Astrophotographers such as myself use tracking mounts that help position our telescope and track the stars over a period of time using gears that rotate at the same speed of the night sky. As I'm sure you can imagine, when you're using a telescope that is as zoomed in as it needs to be to photograph galaxies and nebulae, it puts a lot of demand on the mount you're using to track the night sky perfectly with a ton of precision and accuracy. And this level of accuracy is often hard to obtain when you don't have $10,000 to spend on a professional observatory mount. So in this video, I'm going to take you on a journey tonight as I photograph a nebula from my backyard. And along the way, I will share the secret to how astrophotographers make sure that their mounts track pixel perfect. Let's go. All right, we are all set up. As you can see right here, we are ready to go for tonight. It is looking beautiful. It's been a very long time since I've seen this yard with perfectly clear skies without any smoke. I've had perfectly clear nights, but I haven't had perfectly clear smokeless nights. So I am loving these dark blue skies. The yard, it just gets so ugly when there's smoke around. It just looks so polluted, and it, but it just looks so pretty out. Let me show you. There's nothing better than this. I mean, look at how blue those skies are and how pretty that looks. And then you got the sun right behind those trees there. It is going to be a great, great night. If you decide to watch more and more of my videos as I continue to make them, which I don't plan on stopping making them anytime soon, you'll hear a lot of me talking about how much this yard means to me. Every single tree that I see out here is special to me. And as weird as that seems, it, when you're out here for hours and hours at a time, just looking at what's around you, it really does begin to have an impact. There are so many memories that I've made in the past four years of doing astrophotography in this yard here. And my whole experience of doing astrophotography would be completely different if I was in a different yard. So I'm hoping with this YouTube channel, you'll begin to familiarize yourself with the yard and the environment that I shoot in. And hopefully it can begin to inspire you to think the same way about your yard if you're not already. So if you look closely at my setup or any experienced astrophotographer's setup, you'll notice a second telescope that's actually mounted on top top of the main one. Now, if you're experienced with astrophotography, you know where I'm going with this, but if you're new here, this is called a guide scope, and this red camera you see at the back here is called a guide camera. And this whole setup is really the secret weapon to making sure your mount tracks perfectly, literally pixel perfect in the night sky. The word of the day here is auto guiding, and that's what this whole setup is about. It's the process of capturing a live view of the stars in which your telescope is pointed at, and this camera will detect the stars in the field of view. If it notices that a star starts to drift out of frame or drift off of the pixel it's supposed to be on, this camera will send a correction to my mount's tracking and actually nudge it by a pixel back to where it's supposed to be. It sounds very complicated, and if I'm being honest, the computer does all the work. I really don't have to do anything besides calibrate it once every month, but the real head scratcher is getting this set up for the first time. I thought this was going to be a breeze when I first got this set up in very early 2021 and boy was I wrong. It took seven months of trial and error to get this specific setup configured with this mount. Normally the process of setting things up will go a lot quicker than that, but I came across a lot of unique issues that not a lot of other people encounter, so I'm gonna state those in this video too, and if you're coming across the same issues that I was, hopefully it'll help you. 
I'll do a full walkthrough on how to set this up and get it running tonight once the sun sets later in the video, but as of right now, that's the basic overview of what auto guiding is. It's all run through a software called PHD2 Guiding. There's a lot of other softwares that you can run, but PHD2 is what you're gonna see 99% of astrophotographers using. It's free and honestly, it's just the best. The only reason I can think of that you wouldn't use PHD2 is if you were using a setup such as the ASI Air by ZWO, which is a personal computer that that only runs ZWO software. In that case, you'd have to use the software that ZWO offers. But if you're using a Windows computer like I am, PHD2 is the way to go. One last thing I forgot to mention is how to connect your camera to your computer. I actually got a lot of questions about this at the Cherry Springs Star Party. A lot of people would go up to me asking how I configured everything. So I'm gonna show you right now. So here's the setup. This is the main camera and this is my guide camera, the ZWO ASI 120mm Mini. As you can see, it's only one cable. There's two possible options to put a cable into. There's an ST4 port here and then a USB 3.0 port here. If you want to go through a lot of pain and suffering, by all means put it in the SD4 port, but if you want your life to be easy, go for the USB 3.0. All I have is I have this connected to a normal USB port in my mini PC up here, and I haven't had any issues with this cable since. The cable came with my camera, so as long as you have a ZWO camera, I can guarantee you that it'll come with yours too, but you are not limited to that cable. You can use a ton of other USB 3.0 to USB BA cables. I just use the one that it came with because it's the most convenient for me. So as long as you have your computer, your telescope, and your camera all set up and you know that everything is physically together, you have your cable, the last thing you need is your computer drivers to be installed. So go ahead and install whatever drivers you need for your camera. For me, I use a ZWO camera, like I said, so I just went on their website and downloaded the drivers that I needed. It's very easy, just go to the drivers panel. But once you have all your drivers and PHD2 guiding installed on your computer, you are physically ready to go for tonight. And I'm going to walk you through how to get everything set up within PHD2. I think I forgot to mention what target I'm shooting tonight. I'm going after the Crescent Nebula in Cygnus tonight. I've been shooting this object on and off for the past two months now, and I just have not gotten good enough data to complete an image. It's all been because of that smoke. Um, it's been so annoying. Every time I shoot it, either clouds come in or it's smoky, and I just cannot get a good image. So tonight I am finishing it off once and for all. This is the final battle I'm gonna have with Cygnus this year. This will most likely be the last object in Cygnus that I capture until 2024. I hope so, because I am kind of done with shooting nebulae in Cygnus. But yeah, if all goes according to plan, then at the end of this video, I'll have a pretty nice image of the Crescent Nebula. I just gotta wait until it gets dark. All right, it is a beautiful night, just like I was saying earlier. Apart from the cicadas, which are going crazy, it's perfectly still out. There's not a single gust of wind and the temperature is perfect. The mosquitoes haven't gotten to me yet, so fingers crossed that they don't find me later in the night. But as for right now, I am really, really comfortable out here. It is about 8.45 in the evening right now and the last moments of daylight are fading away. Man, it is so pretty out. The full moon is rising beyond the trees right behind me right now. It's actually not 100% full yet. It's really just in its waxing gibbous phase, but it's still pretty bright. This is why I picked the Crescent Nebula for tonight. It's a really nice, bright hydrogen alpha nebula that I can actually get a decent image from during a full moon. All right, it is just a couple more minutes until I'm able to polar align my setup when I can see enough stars to do the Nina three-point polar alignment. I might need to move my setup a couple feet in one direction or the other to be able to see Cygnus a little bit better and get a little bit more imaging time on it, but I am really excited to see what kind of image I can get tonight considering it is quite literally the perfect conditions besides that full moon.
All right, I am finally completely polar aligned. I am so happy to be saying that right now. I have been polar aligning with Nina for probably the past 45 minutes. Sometimes I luck out in my polar alignment and I just kind of guess where my mount is going to be and it's just sort of close. But this was not one of those nights. I guessed very poorly. And so I was re back to Zenith and doing my three points and then adjusting. If you've ever done three point polar alignment, you know how painstaking that can be to redo the whole process over and over again until you get it right. Oh my gosh, that was a huge pain. But I am finally ready to show you guys how to configure PhD2 guiding. So the last thing that I'm going to say as a sort of precursor to everything that you need to make sure you have figured out before you can follow this tutorial is make sure that you have your mount connected to your computer in some way. It's usually a USB cable. I know that's how mine is. Just make sure that it's connected to your PC in some way so that you can control it through software and you're not using the hand controller. Because if your mount can't talk to your computer, there's no way for the computer to send those pulses, those corrections to the mount like I was talking about earlier. All right, now that all of that is out of the way, let's get into our computer here. So you can see right now in Nina, I have the three-point polar alignment dialog open, but what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm going to open PHD2 guiding. So I'm gonna click on that. All right, so PHD2 is open now. I'm going to navigate down to the bottom here where you see this little USB cable. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And you can see I already have all my gear inputted because I've been using PHD2 previously. But if it says, I, I don't know, maybe it'll be blank, but make sure you have your camera set from the drop down menu to whatever brand your camera is. So if it's ZWO like mine is, I'm gonna go ahead and scroll all the way down to the Z's and click on ZWO, but they have every brand that exists and more of camera on here. So don't be worried about compatibility issues. And then for the mount, this is where it gets a little tricky. You don't have as many options. So I know my mount is a Skywatcher SIN scan mount. So even though it's not in the HEQ5 lineup of mounts, I still select HEQ5 slash six because it has that same SIN scan system as that mount. So if you don't have a similar mount to what I have, maybe do a little bit of research, read some manuals, go on some websites and figure out which dialogue you wanna hit in PHD2 to connect your mount. If you are using multiple cameras of the same brand, like me, I have a ZWO guide cam and a ZWO main imaging cam. You wanna make sure you wanna hit this little arrow button that you're given right here and make sure that you have your guide camera selected. You don't wanna be guiding using your main camera, obviously, because then you're not gonna be able to take any pictures. So make sure you have your guide camera selected. Now, once everything is ready to go, you wanna hit connect all. Nothing should happen, it, but it should say like gear connected. It shouldn't start doing anything. You shouldn't see any pictures. It shouldn't start taking any pictures until you hit the loop button. So that's this little arrow circle thing, sort of looks like the recycling logo, and you should see a, a sort of image pop up. Now if you haven't focused your guide camera beforehand, you'll probably see something that doesn't look like this. You'll probably see very bloated stars if you see any stars at all. So go ahead and focus your guide setup before continuing on with the tutorial. Now I'm already focused so I can go ahead and go. What you're going to want to go ahead and do if you haven't done this already is you're, you're going to want to go to the brain here, go to guiding and select the use multiple stars button. In my experience with using PHD2, I haven't personally noticed that the use multiple stars function actually boosts your guiding performance and corrections in any way. The only thing I have noticed is that when clouds pass over, and if it's partly cloudy, it'll just auto direct to one of the other stars that it sees, and you'll have a better chance of not losing any stars when clouds are passing over. So once you have used multiple stars selected and you're all focused, hit this little star with a magnifying glass. That'll auto detect all the stars that it sees you should see a bunch of circles and then one square. The square around that star means that that star, it thinks for whatever reason, is the best star for guiding. What I tend to realize is that it tends to pick a star in the medium brightness, so it's not too dim, but it's not the brightest one either, and it makes sure that it doesn't pick one too close to the edge of the frame. So all the other circles are the other stars that have not been deemed worthy of being the best. So now that it knows what stars to pick, you are going to shift and click this 
PhD2 logo. What that's going to do is it's going to start calibrating your guide setup. So it's gonna start pushing the mount in all four directions that it can go into, and it's gonna measure and keep track of when it pushes the mount one direction, which way does that star go? When it pushes the mount another direction, which way does that star go? And that basically lets it figure out which way is your guide camera rotated, because if it didn't do this, and your guide camera was rotated 180 degrees, if it wanted to push it up, it would actually be going down and it would have no way of correcting properly. So calibration is key. Well, rookie mistake here. I've been wondering why PhD2 has been losing my star. Make sure that you are actually tracking when you're doing this. Don't set your mount to not tracking. I've never made that mistake before, and the first time I make that mistake is when I'm recording. About these clouds here, it looks like it's just gonna brush over me, because I don't, I don't see any other clouds in the area. It's just kinda one big thing, so I think it's just gonna brush over me and then it'll be done. I'm fingers crossed that it doesn't get any bigger because these kind of clouds can sort of develop into overcast. It said clear the whole night on all the weather apps that I saw, so I'm hoping that goes away, but whatever. Guiding calibration can take forever, so don't change any settings to rush it because how it's set to the default is 99% of the time going to be the best configuration. The more steps it takes and the longer the distance the star goes away from the center to figure out what direction it goes, the more accurate it's going to be. So you want to take that time and really get a really nice calibration so that you can guide well throughout the night because if you rush your calibration then the whole night isn't going to go well. And it's always worth losing a little bit of imaging time and then getting great imaging results the rest of the night versus getting a lot of imaging time of images that aren't great. Alright, so once your calibration is done, it should automatically start guiding. How you know it's guiding is one, it'll say guiding, and two, the graph will start to show. This is the infamous PhD2 guide graph. Now if your guide graph isn't perfect and perfectly flat, everyone will yell at you and they will all think you are a terrible astrophotographer. Now, obviously I'm completely kidding. Your guide graph does not matter as long as it's not reflected in your image results. If your stars are sharp and your guide graph looks terrible, don't worry about it. You shouldn't stress over this graph at all unless it looks absolutely crazy. In my case, when I was having the issues with polar alignment, it did look absolutely crazy, but it was also very apparent in the sub-exposures that I was getting. So like right now, I can sort of see that it's dipping down below, but it's gonna come back up, and I'm confident in that, because in the first couple seconds, in the first, let's say, 30 seconds, it takes a second to sort of settle itself and get into the groove. So as long as you are making sure that your stars look sharp in the field of view, you're good to go. So if anyone yells at you because your guide graph doesn't look good or your stats aren't perfect and you're happy with the images that you're getting, please do not let that affect how you feel about your images. When you post an image to Instagram or show it to your family and friends, they're not gonna look at it and go, I bet your guide graph in PhD2 was terrible that night. No, they're gonna think about how that image makes them feel and what they see in that image. So even if your stars are the tiniest bit trailed and you know it's a couple pixels off, as long as you feel good about that image, don't let that stop you from sharing it with everyone is the moral of the story here. The numbers you see here is how many arc minutes you are off of being perfect. So you want to have this as low as possible. Before tuning my mount, this thing stock was getting about 1.5 arc minutes of error, which, which at this focal length is about the maximum amount of error you can have before it starts reflecting in your images. Generally, you want your error to be below one arc minute, so you want this to say zero point something, and anything under 0.7, in my experience, is great guiding. So let's say you are having an issue with your guiding for whatever reason. Maybe your star is going crazy or you got the dreaded pop-up of PhD2 cannot make sufficient corrections in whatever axis. I hate that pop-up. Here are my suggestions on what you can do to fix that. Number one is get a software such as SharpCap or Nina and 
make sure you check your polar alignment with numbers. If you are eyeballing your polar alignment, you might not be doing it as precise as you think you are. Even if you spend a couple minutes really nailing it, you might be off for whatever reason. Maybe your axis is tilted too much. So get a software like Nina to tell you physically with numbers how off you are in arc minutes, and that should save you a lot. That's what saved me. The second thing to check is your balance. Balance is key. When you see me and I get that b-roll of me fiddling with my setup and I'm sort of flipping the axes around, most of the time I'm not doing nothing. I'm actually checking the balance of my axis. So if I flip the mount axis one way and I let go and it, the mount tilts in one direction, I know that it's off balance. What it should do is you should let go and it should stay exactly where it is. Same thing with the declination axis. If I spin the telescope like that and I let go and it goes in one direction, it's obviously off balance so you want to make sure that you've adjusted your counterweight and you've adjusted the position of the telescope to make sure you're perfectly balanced another thing I will want to check is for cable snags I have the cable spaghetti problem my cables are drooping everywhere they're kind of all over the place some of them are hanging almost down to the ground man I really do need to fix that but the big thing is none of them are snagging on anything I'm fortunate enough to have a setup that doesn't have a lot of hooks and you know any sticky outy parts to get things clipped around and hooked on and stuff so there's nothing that can really snag but if you have crazy spaghetti like I do and your mount does have hooks and you know whatever that stuff can get clipped on and a cable does get snagged on one of those spots it's obviously going to be pulling on your mount and the tiniest bump or snag to your setup and your guiding is going to go absolutely nuts so make sure you have all your cables under control it doesn't have to be the neatest in the world but as long as it's not snagging on anything you should be good and the very final thing you want to check is your level on your mount so how level are you are you tilted at all a lot of people that I see setting up just sort of set their tripod down and then start balancing everything. You want to make sure that you want to make sure that when your mount is all set up that you are flat and you are level and you're not tilted in any way because that's obviously going to affect things. It's, it affects things just as much as your polar alignment or your balance does, if not more. My yard is on a slant. It sort of goes downhill. So over there is actually higher than where I'm standing right here. And it's a very uneven yard. There's lots of dips and bumps in places. So I could move my telescope over a foot and it'll be in a new dip or a new you know bump or something and it'll be tilted the point of PhD 2 is to electronically correct your mounts mechanical tracking so make sure that all that you can do has been done to the fullest leveling your mount balancing all the stuff I talked about make sure that that's all good and once that's all good PhD 2 should be able to do the rest on its own without changing anything really the people who created this software, PHD2, are astrophotographers. They wouldn't make this software and give it to people with settings that make your mount track terribly. If you really want to dig into the settings here or there and make your mount track that much a tiny bit better, by all means, go ahead. But I notice that it's a very risky process because I find that changing settings often hurts you more than it helps you. So I hope that me giving you these tips was helpful in some way. I know that if I was able to watch this video two and a half years ago when I got my first auto guiding setup, I would have been saved a lot of hassle. So I hope that this has the same impact for you I really do if you notice anything that I missed or that you've experienced go ahead and leave a comment down below on uh, tips and tricks and I'll and I'll try to boost them to the top and make sure other people can see that too good news those clouds seem to be gone not only have they blown away but it also seemed like they dissipated so that's really good uh, the moon is setting now and I've missed a lot of time with Cygnus being up it's risen by probably about 20 25 degrees now so you know it's never a good thing to miss out on imaging time, but it's a bright nebula. I'll, I'll be fine, right? All right, so as you can see in the background there, my setup is slewing and finding the Crescent Nebula right now. Once it's all centered, it's gonna start taking five minute sub exposures until the end of the night. So I should be able to get around three to four hours of imaging time tonight on the Crescent Nebula. And I'll add that onto a previous three hours and 20 minutes that is combined with stuff from last month when I was just messing around and last year's image. As I get more and more comfortable with YouTube and being in front of the camera and talking to all of you guys 
I have really found a love for doing this. In the past year or so of doing astrophotography, especially since I got my mini PC and didn't need to be outside with a laptop the whole time, I was sort of falling out of love with the whole astrophotography experience because I didn't need to be out there with my setup anymore. I could just leave it set up and start pushing all these buttons and it would be going and I didn't need to go outside once. The only reason I would need to go outside is to take flat frames or uncover my setup. But now through YouTube, I'm sort of forced to, you know, get footage of what I'm doing and most of all talk about what I'm doing. So I'm not only filming the stuff that I like and would just look at for a second and say, oh, that's cool and then go on. I'm documenting it and I'm sharing it with you guys. But yeah, filming these videos now have really taken me back to when I was a beginner, you know, kneeling down next to my tabletop telescope, desperately trying to find the Ring Nebula or the Andromeda Galaxy through a 25 millimeter eyepiece, getting frustrated and coming inside with sky guide open going, why can't I find this, you know? In the moment, I was extremely frustrated and just ready to go to bed. But nowadays, I look back on those nights and think that is the reason that these images feel so good after I take them. That is the reason I want to share this with other people. I really want to help some of you guys have that that moment where you're like I can do this you know. So yeah you guys may not have realized this but making these videos and having you guys watch them and comment the amazingly supportive comments that you guys do really helps me along my astrophotography journey and it helps me appreciate the night sky and this crazy hobby a little bit more. So with that being said, I really do appreciate you guys sticking it through and watching to the very end of the video. And with that being said, I will see you all on the next clear night. I was able to get a grand total of around 6 hours and 30 minutes on the Crescent Nebula. Being one of the last summer targets I'll capture this year, I'm really happy with how it turned out. And I can't wait to see what the rest of 2023 has in store.